thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So today is going to be a day of firsts because this is my first YangoCon. This is my first time I give a talk at a conference ever. This might be the first time that you guys hear about Django channels. The first time I wore this jacket too. <laughs> so let's start. Why WebSockets? Why talk about WebSockets? Well, well, the thing is that actually uh, web applications have been growing more and more every year. And now we have way more robust applications, not only on the, on the back end, but also on the front end. The front end interfaces are way more complex. And they now need to talk to the, to the server uh, more regularly. As well as, a, as the server, uh, we're now processing more data on, this, on the server. So what this happens is that with our regular HTTP uh, parity of request response, there's a lot of latency in this communication. And in order to solve this, some, well, uh, we created the, the WebSocket specs. Uh, and basically what, what WebSockets is, the idea behind WebSockets is to have a persistent connection between the client and the server. By having this persistent connection, we can just send information back and forth and anybody can start sending the data, even the server or the client. With this, we lower our, our latency and we have a better response and a real-time application. Uh, we can see the difference on both protocols here, which is the HTTP, it just opens a connection, sends a request, then the, the server processes the request, sends the, the request back, I mean the response back, and it closes the connection. While on WebSockets, the channel is always open unless the client closes it or the server decides to close the, the connection. Uh, so let's take a, a quick look at, at the WebSockets spec, just some key points here. First of all, we need to realize that WebSockets still run on top of TCP IP, it's just a persistent connection. And also the way to start a WebSocket or to open a WebSocket is to, give a, uh, to send an HTTP request, but it has an upgrade header on it. Um, and after this, the WebSocket is open and all the data that goes through it, it actually goes in frames that are called messages. We're going to call these WebSocket messages just to avoid confusion. So what about on the server side? What's happening? Because that's, that's what we're here for. So let's take a look at, at a WebSocket server under the hood. I'm not going to go into much detail, but just the, the overall overview. Uh, so the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that WebSockets cannot be handled by regular WSGI workflow. Because if we take a look at the WSGI workflow, it is pretty much based on, on the regular HTTP request response paradigm. So whenever a client sends a request, the server processes it, and when the server is processing the request, we have this workflow right here, which is we, uh, the packet is probably going to go through an HTTP server like Apache or Nginx, and then it's going to go to the WSGI server, which will then send all the information with header and a WSGI dictionary to Django. Django is going to process all, the, uh, process all that data and create the response, and then it will send it back to the, to the client, and the connection is going to be closed. Now, when this is happening here, when, when everything happens through the, through, through the WSGI server, and then, and then Django gets called and all that, that's happening on a thread. So if we would like to keep this same workflow, and try to implement WebSockets, that will mean that whenever our response goes back, this thread is not going to finish. This thread is not going to exit, and we're going to have to keep the thread running on an infinite loop just waiting for other messages, either from the server to the client or from the client to the server. Obviously, this is not very scalable, and we're going to run out of, of threads very quickly. So one of the solutions, actually, is uh, a concept that's called offloading. And offloading is using one or more threads to handle slower loading running tasks, which can be managed in a non-blocking way. Uh, we can see that now our workflow changes a little bit. Usually in production, what, what we see with WebSockets is that uh, a lot of people just run two different WSGI servers. One of them is going to process all the HTTP requests the way that we all know, and the other one is going to process the WebSocket messages. So now. Here's where, where things get interesting, because when a WebSocket message comes in, what's happening is that the WSGI server actually fires up a worker thread, which will then process the request. This is going to free the WSGI server to be able to handle any other concurrent requests that are going to come into, or messages, WebSocket messages. Uh, so this is an improvement on, 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 the whole, on the whole workflow. But the thing here is that now we're starting to talk about threads, uh, direct threads. We're, we're, we're talking about uh, using threads to process the, the request, and how do we manage this? Well, 
there is a lot of intricacies in the whole topic of this, but the simple answer is just to use an async library, something like gevent or, or a sync IO. Uh, there's a lot of different, different uh, libraries like this in, in Python. Now, the issue with this is that, is that there's, there's a lot of things that we need to keep in mind, and there's a lot of caveats just, we just when, when we start diving into the whole asynchronous uh, topic and, and thread managing. So first of all, let's, uh, let's mention that offloading is not a new concept, and other frameworks are using it, like Node.js or maybe Go to. Uh, we are diving into the async world, and as I was mentioning, this has a lot of different, different issues. Uh, one of them, well, there's, there's a lot of, of different issues that, that can make us actually shoot ourselves in, on the foot very easily. Um, and we need to, to figure out also how to set, how to make these threads to communicate with each other in order to, uh, to persist the data, let's say the session data or cookies data or things like that, because every thread that we fire up is gonna be working on a, or is gonna be processing things on, on a different context. So there, we, we can't just put data on global variables and expect all the threads to know about, about those variables. Uh, the, the, but the cool thing is that by using this new workflow, now our application is event-based. Now our, our server is not going to send information only when the client clicks a button or refreshes a page or something like that, but we can also run long-running tasks on the server and whenever something happens on the server, we can let the client know one or many clients. Uh, there are still physical constraints, of course. This is another thing that we need to keep in mind, which is the amount of worker threads that we can actually use, the processing power, and the memory capacity. Uh, now, how to bring web sockets into Django? Well, there are different ways to do this. Um, uh, the, the whole point of this talk is to talk about Django channels, but I'm gonna talk about other projects that, that try to actually do this just to see where does Django channels actually come from and what is Django channels is it's actually trying to solve. So the first solution that people came up with is to use just another entire complete different service to handle WebSockets like Node.js. And this is going to change our workflow a little bit and it, it will be something like this. So we can still use our HTTP server to, to load balance different requests. The HTTP requests, they're gonna be handled by Django and the WebSockets can be handled by Node.js. Now the only thing is that we don't want to actually start developing things in two different languages on the server. So we might want to build a, a RESTful API so they both can talk and, and that way Node.js can get some information that it needs whenever a message comes in. Uh, this, is, this, this is still, is still putting a lot of different uh, overhead on the whole communication of this. Nevertheless, it is a solution that, that people use out there. So the, the other thing is that these are just two different uh, technologies which can be hard to maintain sometimes. And it's really not Django native. It's more of a, of a kind of hack, although it works. Um, the other thing is that we can just use another Python asynchronous event framework like uh, Twister or Tornado. So the idea is basically the same one a little bit since we'll, we'll be running Django in parallel with this other uh, asynchronous event framework and then we'll, we, we, can, we can make those two talk with each other. The other thing is to use whiskey offloading uh, and, the, uh, and a way to actually make the threads to talk to themselves so that way we don't fall into, into uh, to the different issues that come with, with different thread contexts is to use a storage backend like Redis or something like that that every thread can actually read and write to. So if we already have all these different solutions, they, why talk about Django channels? Why is Django channels try to solve if we can already just use all of that? Well, the thing is that, first of all, none of these solutions are actually Django native. I mean, this, these are just kind of things that you run in parallel with Django and what we love and like and we want to, to develop on, it's, uh, it's Django. The other thing is that all these solutions that I just mentioned, they're really not malleable in the way that Django is malleable because Django lets us actually just uh, replace or extend any piece of it the, any way that, that we want it. Maybe use a different library, may, maybe just a modify a library in some way or another uh, or something like that. Uh, the other thing is that 
Django channels is trying to abstract the, the, the async handling of the entire offloading of the threads. That way we don't have to worry that much about it. And, and, uh, and we don't shoot ourselves on the foot that much. Uh, the other thing is that also Django has always been very friendly with other technologies. And, 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 and it's very easy to just um, maybe run a script outside Django or something like that and make it talk to Django and, and Django will, will actually do a lot of pretty cool things with this. So let's just overview uh, again the, 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 the way that, that we can actually implement offloading with WSGI because this is one of the things that, that kind of, kind of uh, approaches more the model of Django channels. So as we remember, we have two WSGI servers, uh, which one of them is going to be handling the WebSocket uh, connections and then fire worker threads. So if we take a look at how Django channels actually works, we can see that this is a little bit like it, not necessarily the same, but the idea behind it is, is the same one. Whenever we have a, a packet com come in, we're going to have an interface server because the processing of the entire of, of all the requests or messages are going to happen on the worker threads, then our our WSGI server or, or, or HTTP server actually becomes only an interface server, which is a layer between our, our Django project and the wild out there. Then after this, we have a channel, uh, a channel backend, which is the, the, the new thing that, that we we're going to talk about. Uh, this is going to let us actually control the different information that all these worker threads are going to need in order to know when, when they're going to fire off and what do they need to do and all that. Then we have the workers. Uh, and then all the worker threads can actually just uh, process different types of requests. It could be WebSockets or it could be HTTP requests or it could be any other kind of protocols. So one, we're going to talk about HTTP or, well, specifically WebSockets, actually. Uh, so let's dive a little bit more into it. What exactly are channels it themselves? Channels are basically just data structures that behaves like a first in, first out queue. They have message expiring, and they have a policy to deliver at most one once uh, to, a, to a listener at a time. This means that when we put a message into a channel, then at most one listener is going to get that message. If something goes wrong, nobody's going to get the message. So we need to, to keep this in, in mind. The other thing is the channels have a unique string identifier, which, is, which makes it very easy to actually just reference one channel in different types of contexts. And the cool part is that this is network transparent, which means that, that it can be accessible over network, which means that we can actually have different servers communicate with each other by using Django channels. And it also has capacity. And that means that whenever we start putting messages into a channel, they're going to stay there until a listener comes in, or a consumer that we're going to, what we want to call it, or a consumer comes in uh, and, and grabs the message. So how do we use channels? Basically, this is the way that, that, that we use channels. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very basic uh, function that we can use. And it's something that's very uh, like views, like Django views. So, uh, and also just like Lango, Django views, we can have function views or class-based views. With Django channels, we can have function function consumers. This is what we're, what, uh, what our consumer function is going to look like, or we can have class-based consumers. Uh, we're going to give examples about about function consumers just for simplicity. So basically, what it is is just a function that is going to get a message, sorry, it's going to get a message as a parameter, and then it's going to send back that message. Uh, there's a few things that we need to, to see on this example. First of all, the, the actual, well, I just created this other function here, which is going to actually process the message. And, uh, and we need to, to see that every message has this dictionary that's called content. So with it, in, inside of it, we can actually access a lot of different information. When we try to access the, 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 key, the, the key text of it, we're actually getting the text that the, the client is sending to the server. And whenever we're going to send back something through, through our WebSocket channel, we need to do it in a key value 
uh, format because it needs to, to be easily serializable in order to go through the, through the web sockets. Uh, so once, once we have our response, we just send it through, through, the, through the channel. Uh, let's talk a, a little bit more about how to communicate back onto the client and, and just to, to have a more visual aspect of it. So we're, we've been talking about channels, which is just a queue, a first in, first out queue. And then we have, we, we have the consumer functions. But how the, the way that they come in and come, come together is that we will have a worker thread pool which will actually uh, assign a thread with, with one of these, uh, of these consumer functions to every message that comes into the channel. But the, the thing is that, that that is how we process in this example, that is how we process uh, a message that comes into the channel, let's say, from a client. But then what about after we process it? Well, if we take a look at this, we're actually using this other thing on, on the message object, which is called reply channel. So for every client that sends a, a message or that opens a, a WebSocket into the server, we're going to, well, the Django channel is create a, a reply channel. And this reply channel, it's just, it's a, it's a unique channel. It, it has a unique uh, string identifier, and this is mapped always to just one client. So whatever we send through that is going to get sent back to the client. Uh, so the only thing is that we're now talking about sending, sending stuff back to the client, but just to one client. And that's not always fun, because what about if we want to wanna implement the overly used chat or something like that, or maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, let's say just a, a broadcast application, then we need to send the mess different messages or, well, the same message to different reply channels. So we will have to, to keep that in mind. We will have to, to keep the track of, the, of all of those reply channels that we need to and then look through those and all that. <clears throat> Luckily, Luckily, uh, Django channels already comes with something that's called groups. So what they do is that they keep track of a set of reply channels or regular channels. We need to, to keep that in mind that that is not only for reply channels. We can also make groups for, I don't know, maybe a cluster of servers that we want to send some information and then make them process something. Uh, the other thing is that they have an expiration policy because, because a, a group is just, is just a, a cluster of members then whenever we put a, a, a message in all of those in, in all of, of those channels, then we need to keep track whenever those messages actually expire, or else we might just keep sending messages to to expire connections. Uh, so this is basically the way that we use uh, the, that we use channels, and it is very easy. Django channels, the project itself, it's actually has actually given us all the interfaces that we need to make all of this easy. As we can see. Uh, right now, I'm setting up three different consumers, consumer functions. The first one is going to, to fire up whenever somebody connects through a WebSocket. And what's happening here is that we're just creating this group broadcast, and we're going to add the reply channel. Now, this, the creation of the, of the group, it's actually implicit here, because if it doesn't exist, it's just going to create a group. If it exists, it's just going to add it to that group. Uh, then whenever we get a message, what we're doing here is that we're, we're just echoing that message back to every client in that, in that group. And the way that we do it is that we just use that, this send function and then send it again on a, on a key value format. This becomes pretty easy. And, uh, and we really don't, don't, don't need to, uh, to worry about anything else other than removing the, the, the specific member whenever the WebSocket actually disconnects. So the other thing is, is how are we going to route all of these consumer functions? Well, it is pretty easy. And what we do is that we set up a routing function, I mean, sorry, a, a routing file, which is supposed to live just right next to urls.py. And it's, it actually looks a lot like, like, uh, like urls.py. And this is the way that, that, we, that we map all those consumer functions onto all those different different channels. Now, one thing that, uh, that we need to, to mention here is these three different channels. 
I haven't, I haven't actually explained where do those channels come from, who created those channels, or where, where are they actually uh, instantiated or, or defined. And what happens here is that Django channels also created a, a spec in order to, to give a, a more malleable approach to all, this, to, to all this implementation. And what's happening here is that on the, uh, and this spec is called ASGI as in asynchronous, asynchronous SGI. And the ASGI spec tells us that whatever interface server, as, as we mentioned before, uh, whatever interface server is going to, to follow this spec, whenever it gets a WebSocket connection, is going to create these three different channels. So, the, so, the, so these three different channels, we don't have to worry about creating them or, or configuring them or anything like that, but our interface server is the one who's going to, to create that. I'll talk a little bit more about interface servers in a, in a little bit. Um, so now, now that we know about replay channels, the, the channels that we usually have are a little bit more like this. So we have the worker thread pool, and there's going to be our general channels and our response channels, which those map directly to each one of the clients. And this is the, the, the format that the ASGI spec tells us that the response channel is going to be, which is going to, to contain this exclamation point and then anything on, uh, that, that has to do with, with the, uh, these, these characters. The other thing is that um, how, how do we, oh, sorry, well, we already mentioned how to route uh, the consumer functions onto, onto a specific channel. Uh, so we, we already talked about workers, and let's just go back into our overview of Django channels. Each one of, of these things, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go through it. Uh, so we, we talk about, about these, these different workers, and we mention how to use to, to use uh, consumer functions to actually process the meshes that comes in, in through a WebSocket. Uh, the, the next thing is that how are we going to make all these worker threads communicate with each other? Because we mentioned that Django channels is, is ne network. Uh, well, we can, we can talk with, with uh, Django channels through the network. So how can we actually do this? And the way that we do it is that there is, there is a channels backend layer. And there are out of the box, Django channels uh, support different backend layers. The, the most basic one is memory backend, and this is pretty much only good if, if you're uh, debugging something on your local host, because it's not, it, it doesn't have inter-process communication or anything like that, because it's just a, it's just a, a backend layer in, in, a, in a piece of memory. But we can also use IPC, which is supposed to share memory segments. The benefit of this is that it's also memory, it's, it's lightweight, uh, but it also has inter-process communication, which means that basically we can we can write to a different a different channel or group from outside Django or from 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 any other type of context. And the other one, it's Redis. This is the the one that's that's suggested to actually use in production because it it's uh, it's more robust and it also gives us the the ability to to uh, configure sharding, and, and it, 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 this is the, the, the backend layer that actually works throughout network, because IPC is not gonna wanna work through network, or memory backend is not gonna wanna work through the network. Uh, the way that we use some of these, uh, of these backend layers, in this example, this is Redis. We just install the SGI underscore Redis uh, project, uh, I mean, packet, and then we, put this in our settings.py. As we can see, this is a lot like the, the database configuration, and it's because it's, it, 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 they, they do have some kind of, a lot of similarities. Uh, the same way, if we want to use IPC, we're gonna have to install ASGI underscore IPC, and then use the appropriate, uh, the appropriate uh, uh, model name. So that, those, that's, that's basically how, we, how we, we, we configure a channel backend, and the way that we use it is that whenever we write onto a group or we write into a channel, we're actually writing onto this, this uh, backend layer. And now, what about the interface layers? I mean, the interface servers. So what happens with the interface servers is that Django channels actually already ships with an interface server that's called Daphne. Uh, and this interface server, what it does is that it's based on, on Twisted, 
because Twisted R already gives us an implementation of WebSockets and an HTTP long polling too. Uh, and so Daphne is just using these implementations in order to, to keep to, to the ASEI spec. Uh, what we can do is that we can, we can use Daphne as our sole interface uh, interface server, and, and Daphne can actually have, knows how to handle different requests like HTTP, regular HTTP requests or WebSocket requests, and is going to route them the way that we want it to. Now, the only thing is that Daphne is pretty new, and uh, may, we, maybe we don't want to do that on production, but we can also run Whiskey and Daphne side by side. So the only thing is that we're going to have engine, something like Nginx to actually load balance different requests. So the HTTP requests, they're going to go through our regular Whiskey server, and the WebSocket messages are going to go through Daphne. So basically, the way that, that we're going to, to set up our interface server, because, uh, because our interface server is really just, just another, another server like, like a Whiskey server, we're going to create an ASEI.py uh, file. And we're going to put this into it. And the only thing that, that we're doing here is that we are actually getting the channel layer, which is the one that we configure here. As you can see, this one is called channel layers. And we're, we, this, this one is the, the default one. We can have multiple channel layers, too, if we want to, if our application is very convoluted and maybe there is a lot of different types of, of servers in the, in the back end talking to each other, et cetera. Or maybe we just want to separate our, our channel layers by concerns. Um, so, and, and the way that, that we run Daphne, it's basically just doing this. Daphne is the command, and then we just give it, give it this, this, uh, the model, the module as, as, a, as a parameter. Pretty much the same way that we, that we run Whiskey. So that's uh, the interface server. Now, what about, uh, well, we talk about, about how Django channels are actually work throughout the, 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 the network, right? So what about if, how can we, can we use channels from somewhere else outside Django? So the only thing that, that we can, uh, well, the thing that, that we need to keep in mind is that we don't need to be in a specific context to write to a channel. We just, not, we just need to have access to the channel backend layer. And, uh, and, and the way that we do it is just using the same things that, that we've already seen, which is just if, if we already have the, the name or the string of the, of the group, we can just send that to, we, we can just use this interface to actually write to that group, and every member of that group is going to get that, that message. Uh, if we want to send it to a specific client, we can actually just use the reply channel. Now, the reply channel, again, it's only a string. So if we dive into, into the Django channels, uh, can everybody see that? If, if, we, if we dive into, into the Django channels uh, code, we can see that a message actually has a, the, the way that, that they create the, the reply channel is just instantiating a, a channel object with the reply channel string and then just the channel layer. Now, we don't necessarily need to know which channel layer we're going to use if we only have one, because it's always going to default to the default one. Uh, but if we, got, if we have multiple ones, the way that we do it is that we can actually use, use um, just a, a string that's going to be the alias of it. And the alias of it, we've already configured it here. This, for instance, the alias is default. If we add another one, the alias is going to be, I don't know, maybe. Uh, uh, image processing or something like that. So let's continue with this. Okay. Well, now uh, since we still have time, that was a little bit quicker than I expected. Uh, I'm gonna show you real quick how we can write to to a uh, to a Django channel actually outside from Django because I think. This is, this is one example that leverages on, on, all, on every, every aspect of, of, of Django channels. So basically what I did here, I'm just running Django. It's, it's a very vanilla installation of Django, and I'm just running it using uh, run server. So after installing channels, we can see that when we run, when, when we run this, 
we're going to have all this information about the workers. Now, what's happening here is that actually workers are, are being executed in the same, in the same thread as the, as the run server. And this is just because it's for debugging. If we were in production, what we needed to do is to actually run the, the Whiskey server and then run that in another process and then run the, the, the swarm of, of, of worker threads. Uh, so now we know that, that we're listening on all these different channels. HTTP request is another channel that the ASGI spec tells us that the interface server is going to create whenever an HTTP request comes in. Uh, so if we go into the client, let's delete this. Basically, the way that we do it is that we create a WebSocket like this. WebSockets, uh, the, the support for WebSockets are in actually most of the major uh, browsers, and we, we, can, we can just open a web socket like this. It's, it's pretty easy. Once we created it, we get all this information back. Now, if we take a look at this, I have uh, here, what I'm doing is that I'm actually printing different information that we can get from, from a web socket. So as we can see here, the reply channel, it's just this string. We can see that it has this, this exclamation point here. Um, so if we set, let, we're going to set this, this function, what, what it's going to do is that whenever we get a message on the client, it's just going to, it's, it's just going to uh, print it to the, to the console. So right now, what our, what our backend is, is doing or what our, what our server is doing, it's just doing a, a, an echo on the, on the message itself. So if we send something, we're going to get back the same thing, right? So what about writing something onto, onto a channel from anywhere else? So because we just open a channel, we now have here, obviously on a, on a, on a better project, uh, where we will save this string on a model or something like that. But we can copy this string, and here I'm just on the, on the same uh, virtual machine. And we're going to send it using this, using this, this um, Django command. I'm going to go through the Django command in, a, in a, a little bit. So basically what it's doing is that I'm just giving it a string, which is the, the channel ID. And I'm just giving it a message to send, which right here is just message underscore sent. So once I send it, uh, we can see that we got it here. So now we're, we're actually writing onto Django from outside Django just from, from the console. And what we can, I mean, we can do whatever we want with this. Actually, we can just set up a, a machine um, monitoring system to, to be sending messages to our phones or whatever. So now let's take a look at, at, the, at the command. Basically, this is, just, this is the command that, that I just used. And what it does is that it just grabs the channel ID and then the message, and it creates the channel like that. It just instantiates the channel, and then it just uses the send function to send the message back to the client, and then the client is going gonna, is gonna to get it. Now, the other interesting part about this is the way that we're echoing back the, the, uh, um, the, the message. And let me, sorry. Let me take a look at it. Yeah. So this this is our uh, this this are our three different consumer functions. So as we can see, on the we're gonna have this ws underscore connect function, and what it does is uh, it only tries to print out the user, but because we don't have any kind of of, uh, of authentication, it's going to print an empty string. If you see here, it's just printing an empty string. But this is pretty interesting because the other cool thing about Django channels is that it comes already with different types of, um, of decorators that gives us access to, to, the, to the user object and to the user session. That way we can, we can use authentication or we can just check which user is sending the message and route accordingly. Or maybe we can just um, put something on the, on the user session. Uh, now, the important thing to note here is that we're going to use these 
uh, this, this decorator whenever a user connects, because whenever a user connects is when first is going to send the HTTP uh, packet, and then after that, any consequent messages that go through, through the WebSocket, it doesn't actually has any other type of information that, that a regular HTTP request is gonna have, like cookies or session or all that. So when we use this, Django Channels actually saves all of that data, and then when we wanna use it again on a message, we use this other, this other um, uh, decorator, which will then give us access to the session. Uh, so here, the only thing that, that, that we're doing is just sending it back to, to the user. That, this is a, a pretty basic example. I'll be uploading actually a more a convoluted example or more complete example afterwards. Just didn't want to, to go through a lot of lines of code at the same time that, as the talk. So uh, any questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, what I was curious about, uh, what you described um, using kind of the hybrid WSGI um, um, ASCII model yeah. is you're essentially running two copies of the application, correct? I mean, the ASCII um, works similarly to how, you know, Gunnikorn or UWSGI does today with where it essentially is the loader for your application? Yeah. Okay, so you're basically, so there's going to be some implications there then for, uh, you know, like how you would size an instance uh, for running that sort of model then. Well, actually, what I, what, uh, what the whole model what what it does is that it's going to to just if you if we take a look at how we are running our interface server, mm -hmm. uh, this is the only thing that we're that we're giving it. We're only giving it the channel layer. So it's I think what what you're saying is that is that then the the interface server is actually running another Django instance and all that. But actually, what it's doing is that is that whenever a message comes in, it's just going to fire up or well, it's going to put it in the channel. And then a worker thread is gonna get that channel and it's just gonna fire up that consumer function. And then that consumer function is just gonna, gonna, gonna put it back there and it's, it's gonna come back into it. And because Django channels is just everything inside Django, then we can, we can still use things that, that we still use in Django like models or any other things. But it's not actually just firing up another instance or another thread of Django. We're, the only thing that, that, that we're giving it there is just, it's just those, those things. Okay, and then uh, the communication then between the WSGI side of things and the ASCII side of things, that would be via the back-end message. Yeah, via, via the back-end layer. So you would not be able to use uh, that kind of hybrid model uh, with a memory-only back-end. You would have to use at least IPC. Well, you, you, can, you can use it, yeah, with IPC. The only, the only thing with, with IPC is that you cannot use it through the network. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. If you can go talk about how to do this. Um, <laughs> So my question for you is, like, obviously you've done a lot of experimenting with channels. What do you think is the most thing that's missing most from channels so far? That is missing most? Yeah. What, what, what do you want? Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty uh, interesting idea. But I think the, the, the things that, that are missing a, a little bit maybe is just uh, some, something on top of the, of the current interfaces that it already has uh, to make it a little bit more, more easier, for instance, to, to send a, a message to a, to a channel from outside Django, but, but to a specific user. I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to do it with, with groups, but let's say that I, I want, that I have two servers, right? And then one server is just, just the front end, it just handles requests for the front end, and then the other one, it does some kind of, of heavy, heavy uh, processing, like machine learning processing or something like that. So then the first server, I, I would like to use Django channels to actually have these two communicate with themselves. So then on the first server, I want to, to send that information through the channel and then on the, or, or through a, a group maybe. And then on the, on the other server, I would like to send that just to that specific reply channel. So just getting a hang on, the, on that reply channel, it sometimes gets a little bit convoluted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, hi. Um, I was wondering, and maybe I, you may have just kind of explained it, um, but between the persistent, um, the interface server and the channel layer, yeah. um, how do you handle persistence if you were going to have multiple servers? Like, at what point, like, so if each channel is going to a client and the client comes back in through your load balancing situation and ends up in a different place over here, how do you make sure that they're still in the channel. 
like well, do that in your load balancing or? Okay, let, yeah. let me see if, if I uh, if I got that question correct. Uh, and and what happens here is because of, of the of the backend layer. If we use something like Redis, then it's going to go through through the network. So whenever a message comes in, then that is going to to go to a channel that's that's going to be called let's uh, as we saw WebSocket dot message, right? I mean, sorry, I think it was received. So when it goes through that channel, actually anybody that has access to Redis it's going to be able to, to read that, that channel. And Django Channels is going to go like, OK, somebody needs to, to take care of this message. It's going to tell that to the worker thread pool. The worker thread pool is going to grab that. Now, we're going to have different worker thread pools trying to grab that message. But one, is, is one, one of those threads is, is the only one who's going to grab that message. And then the other one's going to go like, all right, that this, this was already taken care of. Now, when going back, that's why we have the reply channels, which are unique for clients. So whenever you put there, the only thing, nobody else is going to get that message on, unless that, that one client. Hence, why Django channels, the policy of Django channels is to deliver at most once to, to one listener or any kind of message okay. instead, of, instead of deliver to, to many. Thank you. No problem. So to clarify that, so with, the, with the, Redis, the Redis handles the incoming, but it doesn't, it doesn't notify in terms of outgoing is what you're saying. Like, like, because right now, that in a normal way of doing it, that's what we we'll do now. Like, the income to Redis, Redis would signal, right? And then once they're done processing, it would signal back to Redis, and then and then update everybody, right? Yeah, that's, that's true. But that, but now with with Django channels, that's not true, or is that still true? Uh, wait, uh, I got a little bit confused there. So you mean that, that when going back, when when sending back to to the to the client? Yeah. Well, actually, yes, because the one that sends back to the client, it's also a worker thread. So something, because, because uh, we need to remember that a replay channel, it's just that, it's another channel. The only thing is that it has a unique string, so that way we're not going to have uh, different members on that, on that one channel. Uh, this is just going to have one, one, one client. So whenever we need to reply something, we put that, we, we put that message into that channel, and then Redis is gonna is gonna go like, hey, I have something new for somebody. And the worker is somebody's gonna go and grab it, and with that with, with that unique channel, Django channels know how to actually route it back to the client. It's gonna go like, okay, there you go. All right, thank you. One final question. Oh, sorry. Um, so have you played with Celery at all? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, so where I was yeah. going with that is kind of like you know. Uh, a lot of the naming conventions that I see using, like groups, channels, that kind of stuff, I see it a lot in terms of just like Celery implementing AMQP. So it's yeah. cute, like it's a message protocol. So like the future of this, do you end up trying to, do you see yourself trying to push for like persistent message protocol or like website get message protocol like in Django? Because it could, it could grow out to include topics and fan outs and I can see that kind of stuff happening too. So I was curious as to where you saw it going. Yeah, well, actually, uh, the only thing is that Django Challenge is it's it, it kind of resembles a, a, an AMPQ, but it's really not that. What it's trying to do is just, it's just trying to give us a, an abstraction layer for us to actually use something like that. So all of that is really not gonna is Django Challenge is just not gonna try to to put them together. It's not gonna try to clash on that. But for instance, what what I've been using it for is that I I still use use uh, Celery. So whenever a request comes in from let's say a user pushes a button or something like that or clicks a button, then the celery task will start and whenever, whenever the celery task needs to say something to the, to the client, it will just write something to that channel. But that's, that's, that's all the, the involvement of Django channels. Thank you. Cool, so uh, if you have any other questions, these are the ways that you can contact me. My email, my Twitter, it's a little bit weird. And I'm always on IRC. Special thanks to everybody people of Django and these guys too. Thank you.